Oh, okay. Chinmay is recording it, I guess. So, yeah, that is okay. So, I don't need to record it. Is Chinmay here, by the way? Yes. So, I don't need to record this, right? You are recording it. Yeah, I'm recording it. You don't need to. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. All right. Yeah, so uh, whoever was asking a doubt can continue now. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know in C, first of all, basically, what what had to done was that first we will file all the parent home numbers and then push it into array, right? But right, right. What I did firstly was that I just brute for uh, kind of a uh, I take I took n as forty four and then I used to look like normal DP which we had be doing. But mm -hmm. in that only I checked if palindrome of i like it would be of n square log n, right? Can you repeat? I didn't get you. Uh, I'm saying that. First of all, we we chose all the palindrome numbers and pushed it into an another array, another vector, right? Right, right. But but I what I did was that I I traversed from one to n and mm -hmm. one to one forty four and right. I uh, checked which one is palindrome. Mm -hmm. If it is palindrome, then I just uh, uh, made another loop from uh, the value current i to uh, forty four and I just made dp of j plus equal to dp of j minus i. Okay. Okay. So, uh, it passed the pretest, but I thought that it would fail on the uh, main test because it was of forty four into forty four into log yeah, of yeah. n. Yeah. So there are multiple test but, cases, so it yeah, would have failed. So I corrected it and submitted another solution. But now after the contest, I submitted the original one and it passed. So I wanted <laughs> to know that how it will pass because the test, the time limit was two seconds, right? So yeah. yeah. Just... So ideally, it shouldn't have passed. So there are two possibilities. One possibility is that all the test cases, even the system test cases are a bit weak. And the second possibility is that you might have some pragmas or something like that in your code. So did you have pragmas on, in your code? No, I did not have pragmas. Yeah. So no. most probably the test cases were weak. That is the only probable explanation. Okay. I okay. Have. okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, am I audible to everyone? So I'm going to start with the solution to problem A now. I hope I am audible to everyone. Can someone just confirm? Yes, it's audible. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, today I will be discussing the solutions to the first four problems from this round, uh, from A to D. So let's start with the first problem. Uh, it, it was a request. Can you start with D? Because I guess most of, most of the people would have solved A. Yeah, that is true, but uh, you know, some people are like shy enough to not say that they were not able to solve. So taking them into consideration, I think I should start with A only. It, it won't take a lot of time. So I'll try to be as quick as possible okay. for A at least. Okay, so uh, let's see what this problem is saying. So uh, uh, I hope all of you have already read the problem, but uh, for the sake of completeness, I'll just repeat it. So basically Alice and Bob are playing a game and they are taking turns and Alice is the one who is starting first. And uh, in every turn, Alice is allowed to remove a substring of even length and Bob is allowed to remove a substring of odd length. And uh, finally, uh, when the game ends, the game ends when the string becomes empty. And uh, finally, when the game ends, Alice counts the uh, total score that she has got and Bob counts the total score that he has got and the one who has the highest score wins. And they have provided us with the definition of score, uh, which is the total value of all the characters that they remove. Uh, and they have also given that the value of A is one, value of B is two, so on and so forth, right? So we just need to tell whether Alice is going to win or Bob is going to win. And we also need to tell <laughs> that if both of them play optimally, what is going to be the difference? What is going to be the absolute difference of the winner minus the loser? Okay, so that's the problem. So let's start with the solution. So uh, the solution is simply based on one observation that uh, since both of them are playing optimally, So the first thing is that if the length of the string is even and Alice is starting, then there is no reason for Alice to not choose the entire string, right? Because that would maximize her score and that is what we want. So if uh, n, which is the size of the string is even, then Alice takes everything. Okay. Uh, and the second case is that the length of the string is odd. So uh, now things become interesting because uh, Alice cannot take everything. So uh, Alice has a lot of choices and we need to decide what Alice should take in the first turn. And the, the key thing to notice here is that we cannot prevent Bob from choosing at least one character, right? So Bob is going to take at least one character.
and bob is going to take at least one character and uh, another thing that we can notice here is that in the first turn alice cannot take the entire string so she will have to uh, leave at least one character and she would have to leave at least one character from the first and the last characters of the string so that just means that bob will take at least one character uh, from the first and the last ones from the either the first or the last so and another thing to notice here is that uh, we can allow that something like this to happen that alice takes the entire string and bob takes just one character and that is optimal for alice because alice is going first so uh, what we need to do here is we just need to decide whether to give bob the first character or to give bob the last character and obviously uh, <coughs> the one whose value is smaller alice will give that particular character to bob so that is it that is the entire solution we just decide which character from the first and the last character will bob take and the rest of the characters go to alice if the length of the string is odd otherwise alice takes everything so that is it for this problem if you guys have any doubts you can ask otherwise i'll just have i'll just show you guys the code it is really simple so all we are doing here is that uh, first of all we are calculating the value of the entire string which is going to be our answer if n is even otherwise if n is odd then we will subtract two times the value of the minimum character from the leftmost and the rightmost characters and uh, that is it so if the answer is negative then the winner is bob otherwise uh, the winner is alice so we will just output who is the winner and also the answer right <coughs> so yeah this is how this problem is working if anybody has any doubts they can ask otherwise i'll be moving forward to the next problem uh, like why are subtracting two times character uh, that is because i have already added every character here but uh, there is one character which is added once but it has to be subtracted once so net it has to be subtracted twice right because okay. like i hope it okay. makes sense okay okay like you uh, added everything and the first and then subtract yeah 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 all right so if there are no more doubts i think we can move to the next problem now okay so let's go to problem b okay so uh, in this problem uh, what basically this is saying is that we have a string s and we call the string to be perfectly balanced if for <coughs> all the possible triplets t comma u comma v such that t is a non empty substring of s and u and v are characters which are present in s the difference between the frequency of u and v in t is okay so uh, let's try to observe one thing here and uh, uh, first of all let's try to solve this problem ignoring this statement that both the characters u and v should be present in s let's just say that this statement is not there at all we have to look at all the pair of characters u comma v irrespective of whether they are present in s or not okay so that makes our life a bit easier and we'll see how so first imagine that the condition for u comma v to be present in s is not there so then what happens is that let's have a look at uh, so obviously if the, this is not the uh, if this condition is not there then uh, there are like 26 characters in the alphabet so we have to we have to look at all these 26 characters so there will be 26 into 20, 26 into 26 c2 pairs uh, in which we are interested in so uh, there will be 26 characters so let's look at any string whose size is less than or equal to 26 so let's look at a substring whose size is less than 26 <coughs> or less than equal to 26 so if this is the case then what happens is that uh, obviously we have 26 characters and the length of the substring that we have is uh, let's say less than 26 
so then what uh, according to pigeon hole principle we can say that uh, there will be at least one character which will be not present in our string right because if all the characters are present in our string then the length of our string becomes uh, greater than or equal to 26 but we are looking at a substring whose uh, length is less than strictly less than 26 so then we can say that there is at least one character whose frequency is zero okay so what that means is that uh, if there is any character in the string whose frequency is greater than 1 uh, then there will be a problem because let's say that uh, we have a character which is uh, x and it has a frequency of 0 then if if at all there is a character whose frequency is greater than 1 let's say 2 then if we pair that particular character let's say y with x then the difference in their frequencies will exceed 1 so what that means is that <coughs> the frequency of every character should be less than or equal to 1 because if any character has a frequency greater than 1 we will land in trouble i hope this is making sense so <coughs> right now what we have proved is that for any substring whose size is less than 26 the frequency of every character should be less than or equal to 1 and uh, this this is something that we are getting when we have assumed that this condition of uh, u and v being present in the string s is non existent so uh, okay so this is obviously a necessary condition but uh, is it also sufficient well it turns out that it is sufficient why because uh, let's say the string looks something like this so we have our string and we choose a random substring from the string so let's say we choose this substring and uh, i have picked a random su substring and i will prove that this condition of uh, difference is being less than equal to 1 holds for this random substring and so we'll be done so let's say that there are a few full substrings of length 26 here and uh, this last substring is not completely full or it might be full depending on the length <coughs> so this is the last substring of length 26 so <coughs> what happens here is that we know that for every string of size 26 the frequency of every character should be exactly equal to 1 so i can say that the frequency of every character in this part of the string is equal to 3 and the frequency of the first few characters here is uh, equal to 4 so in total i can surely say that the differences in the frequencies is not exceeding uh, one at all because uh, either the frequency of the character is going to be 3 or it is going to be 4 so i have picked a random substring and i have proved that this condition is being satisfied for it and so it is going to be satisfied for every particular substring okay great but now what happens if we take this condition into consideration that the characters should be present in s well the only difference between these two problems is that initially i had considered that all the 26 characters were present in s but now that is not the case so what we can do is that we can simply replace 26 by the number of distinct characters which are present in s so by the number of distinct characters present in s <coughs> and that is it because that is the only thing that was different from the first case so we will just replace by 20, uh, replace the number of distinct characters in s by 26 and that will be it so instead of 26 we'll take the number of distinct characters in s and we will just check all the so let's say the number of distinct characters is equal to x so what we'll do is we'll just check all the substrings whose size is less than or equal to x and we'll verify that every element present here has a frequency uh, not exceeding 1 so the solution is for all substrings of size less than or equal to x the frequency there should be no duplicates basically and this is uh, easy to do because we know that x is less than or equal to 26 so this can be done pretty quickly in uh, at max o of 26 n time which is good enough for our case so yeah that completes the solution if there are any doubts you can ask me or else i'll just quickly show you guys the code so the code is pretty simple first of all uh, i am push, pushing all the characters into this set and finding out the total number of distinct characters and uh, <coughs> then i have this nested loop so for all i from 0 to n minus 1 i am going from i to minimum of n and i plus distinct 
and i am just counting the frequency of each character and if at any point of time i see that the frequency of a character is greater than 1 then i just immediately say that the answer is going to be no and break out so that completes the solution to problem b so like it yeah. can solve like that also like if uh, some a is present then the next position should be different from a like in that way can we solve that yeah in that way we can also solve this problem but uh, then the implementation should be uh, would be a little bit different but yeah we can solve it like that too so like can you tell me that uh, why that approach is working like i solved that but don't know why that approach is so working so what exactly is your method so like what i am doing like first i will check that first character is a okay so okay. the next character should be different from a it can be anything and then uh, the third character should be different from the previous character like that i am solving uh, solving yeah so that is just the same thing which, which i am doing here and the reason for that is that if you look at uh, a substring of size 26 then according to your method every character in that particular substring should be distinct and so, but i am not getting your 26 characters like how you are uh, doing that like it is not clear to me Can you re-explain it little bit, or in the last? Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm doing here is that uh, I'm looking at any substring whose length is less than twenty-six. So obviously, if the length of the substring is less than twenty-six, there will be one character which is not present, right? Uh, out yes. of out of a to z, there will be one character which is not present. So the frequency of that particular character is zero. So if I have a character whose frequency is zero, I cannot have a character whose frequency is greater than one because if I pair those two characters, then their difference will exceed one, right? Oh, yes so that means that in that particular substring every character should be unique because if oh, there are yes. duplicates then the frequency will be greater than 1 so, so like can is... you explain with an example like can you give it with an example yeah so uh, let's say we have a substring like one in the test case only so let's say we have something like this abcba so here we can see that the total number <laughs> total number of distinct characters is 3 a b and c so if we look at this particular substring from uh, the second position to the fourth position we see that b is occurring two times here right oh uh, yes so if b is occurring two times then we can just pick a and b why a because a is not present in this substring at all and so its frequency is going to be zero and uh, b is occurring twice so uh, if we pick a and b here then their difference is exceeding one and that is why the answer is no and for every substring whose length is less than equal to the total number of distinct uh, characters there will be one character whose frequency will be zero obviously uh, yes like okay like what we are doing is that uh, we are finding a character whose frequency is zero and a character whose frequency is at least two like that uh, yeah, yeah, we are doing yeah. and we know that for any particular substring whose size is less than equal to the number of distinct characters there will be one character whose frequency is zero that is why i am only checking substrings whose size is less than the total number of distinct characters okay. so uh, are there any other doubts or should i move to the next problem uh, like you can move okay okay great so that was problem b now let's move to problem c okay so uh, on a personal note i did not like this problem at all because it is kind of too standard to be on a code forces round but uh, let's see what this problem is saying <coughs> so we have a positive integer n which will be given to us and we need to tell the total number of ways n can be written as a sum of palindromic numbers and uh, the way we have to do this is we have to find the total number of distinct multisets of positive palindromic integers such that their sum is equal to n uh, palindromic integers are just integers which read the same forwards and backwards that is pretty standard and uh, uh, one important thing to note here is that uh, these two cases are different Uh, sorry these two cases are not different they are treated the same so 3 plus 1 plus 1 and 1 plus 3 plus 1 are treated the same because they they are just the same multiset so we need to count the total number of distinct multisets okay so let's see so to solve this problem let's <coughs> let's forget about this condition of numbers being palindrome at all so let's forget about the numbers being palindromes instead let's solve a very different problem let's say we have an array of n numbers which are given to us so we have an array of m numbers given to us and a number n 
and we just need to solve for uh, the total number of ways n can be represented as a sum of elements which belong to m which are a part of the array m right so let's say this array is a so all i'm saying is that instead of taking palindromic numbers we just have to take elements from the array a which is given to us so now can anybody here tell me how we can solve this particular problem <coughs> it is like a very standard problem we can solve using dp i mean yeah so there is a very standard solution using dynamic programming and i think you can find this uh, very problem on lead code also it is uh, some variation of the coin change problem so it will either be coin change 2 or coin change 3 or something like that on lead code so uh, you will definitely be able to find this problem uh, the only variation here is that instead of the array a which is given to you you have to use palindromic numbers okay so what to do how to take care of that so to do that we notice <coughs> we notice that the value of n is not very large it is only 4 into 10 raised to the power 4 right so another observation is that the number of digits in n is less than or equal to 5 because the number of digits in a uh, 4 into 10 to the power 4 is 5 okay so uh, if we are if you are supposed to use pal if you are supposed to be using palindromic numbers it kind of makes sense to <coughs> first of all think about the total number of palindromic numbers which exist such that their length is less than or equal to 5 so how many palindromic numbers with length less than or equal to 5 exist and it makes sense to ask this question to yourself because obviously uh, for a number the probability of it being palindromic is really really low and since we only have 4 into 10 raised power 4 numbers uh, the number of palindromic numbers is going to be very very less right uh, on a like if you are just thinking about it uh, randomly then it makes sense that these numbers are going to be really small so uh, we can also solve it using permutation and combination so we have these five places that we need to fill and <coughs> we fill one number here then that particular number should go here as well and then we fill one number here and that particular number should go here as well and we can fill any particular number here so uh, if we have nine choices for every particular number that gives us around uh, 729 values this is a very rough estimate. This is not a, a very accurate thing that I'm doing because uh, not all five digit numbers are to be considered. Only the numbers which are smaller than 44 have to be considered. So uh, this makes this uh, gives us an idea that the number of numbers should be at least less than 729. And that is a very less number. That is a very low number. In reality, I actually pre-computed all these numbers and the size of the set came out to be 498. So uh, then uh, it makes sense to uh, to just simply generate all these palindromic numbers and just solve it using dynamic programming the same way we solve the coin change problem okay so that basically is the solution <coughs> since the number of numbers is small so it is small and it is around 500 we can pre-compute all of them and use dynamic programming. So the dynamic programming is also very standard here, but uh, for the sake of completeness, I will just uh, I will just write down the state of this DP here. <coughs> so I'm I'm using 2D dynamic programming to solve this problem, but there is also a way that you can optimize on the space and just uh, do it using 1D. But uh, for the sake of explaining, I'm using a 2D DP. Uh, can you tell how to do it in 1D DP? Yeah, so uh, first I'll explain using 2D DP and then we'll see how to do it using 1D DP as well. So, <coughs> so what I'm doing here is that uh, DP IJ denotes the number of ways to get a sum of I using the first J elements from the pre-computed vector of palindromic numbers. So using the first J palindromic numbers. So that is it. That is the state of my DP. And now what about the transitions? Well, the transitions are like really easy. So what we do is first of all, we iterate for I. So we iterate for I in one to N, let's say N is 44. And then we basically iterate for J. So J goes from one 
to 498 or whatever is the size of the vector. And now what I'm doing is that there are two possibilities. First of all, the possibility is that I get a sum of I using the first J minus one elements itself. So I DPI. Mean, this will be reverse now because first we have to take the size <laughs> and then we have to take it from one to N. Uh, well, uh, not really. This is also, this will also work and let's see why. So first of all, DPIJ will be equal to DPIJ minus one because I can get a sum of I using only the first J minus one elements. And now I have to, <coughs> now I have to take care of all the elements, uh, all the values, which will give me a sum of I using, uh, the, using the Jth element. So I necessarily have to use the Jth element. So for that, what I can do is I will, uh, basically, I will basically look at the Jth element. And what I'll do is if I minus the Jth element, so I minus, let's say the vector that I have was a, so if I minus J is greater than or equals to zero, then I will basically add something like this. So DP IJ plus equals to DP I minus a of J and J minus one. Okay. Also this line should be above. or maybe it should be here only. Yeah. So DPIJ is DPIJ minus one. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Okay. So this is it. These are the transitions and this way we can solve this problem. So let's just have a look for a look at the code for better understanding. <coughs> so, uh, basically this is what I'm doing. First of all, I just, uh, I trade for all the numbers from one to 44. And I'm calculating whether or not that number is a palindrome uh, or not. If it is a palindrome, I'm pushing it into a vector. And then I'm doing this 2D DP. First of all, if I have to get zero, then DP zero, I is obviously going to be one for all I. So this is kind of like a base case. And then I do my DP. So first of all, I go from one to N and then I go, then I iterate my J from one to the size of the vector, which is 498. And the first thing is that DP IJ is equal to DP IJ minus one. And <coughs> The next thing is I check if I minus the Jth element is greater than zero or not. If that is the case, then I simply add DP I minus the Jth element and J to my answer. Okay. So that is one thing. This is how you can solve it using 2D DP. And there is also a method using which you can solve it using 1D DP. And the way to do that is first of all, you have to reverse the dimensions of your DP, which is that, uh, instead of DP IJ being the number of ways you can get I using the first J elements you have to write it as the number of ways you can get uh, J using the first I elements. And then it becomes a very simple DP and you can optimize it by taking just two layers or not even two layers. You can just keep a single DP array and iterate in reverse direction. And then you can get your answer. So I, I don't think that is very important. You don't really need to know how to do it, but for the sake of completeness, I'm just mentioning it. So are there any doubts here or should I move to the next problem? No. Yeah, yeah. Instead of, instead of tabulation, if I will solve it using just memorization, will it give us, will it give me time clearly? Uh, no, there is no reason that that should happen. The time complexity no. remains the same, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there are any problems which give you TLE on a uh, memorization, uh, like doing DP with recursion and, uh, they pass by just doing an iterative DP because that is very rare. Sometimes maybe because recursion is slow and the time limit is strict that might happen, but in general, that doesn't really happen. Okay. <coughs> All right. So are there okay. any other doubts? No, you can proceed. Okay. So that is it for the third problem. Let's move to the last problem that we'll be discussing. So this one is, uh, an interesting one. Let's see. Okay. So, uh, basically in this problem, we have two arithmetic progressions a and B, or we had two arithmetic progressions a and B, but one of them that is a got lost. And we also have this arithmetic progression C, which contains all the common elements of a and B. So, uh, if the, if an element is common to both a and B, then it is definitely contained in C. So, uh, in the input, we have been provided with two arithmetic progressions, which are B and C. And what we need to do is we need to tell the total number of possibilities that we have for this uh, arithmetic progression a, okay. That is the problem. So the problem is simple. We have been provided with an arithmetic progression B, 
and an arithmetic progression c where c contains all the common elements which are in a and b and we need to tell the total number of possibilities for the for the ap a and that's the problem <coughs> since uh, since an arithmetic progression is defined by three terms uh, the first term the common difference and the total number of terms we have been provided with these three values for both b and c and we need to tell the total number of values of a which are possible it might be the case that there are infinitely many possible values of a in which case we have to print minus 1 uh, otherwise we need to tell the total number of possibilities modulo 10 to the 9 plus 7 so i hope the problem is clear enough let's start going over the solution <coughs> okay so we have this uh, arithmetic progression b with us let's say this is the apb these are the elements of p there can be many elements these elements are uniformly spaced so it makes an arithmetic progression so yeah these are the elements of b and let's circle all the elements which are a part of c so let's say this element is in c and uh, this element is in c obviously since i am leaving two elements I, I always have to leave two elements so this element will be in c this element will be in c so yeah let's say that uh, these blue elements are in b and these green elements are in c okay <laughs> and what we need to do is we need to tell the total number of values of a which are possible so what that means is these elements which are green should also be a part of a okay so this is for diagrammatic purposes now let's write down some main observations so first of all for the situation to be possible one thing that should definitely hold for the answer to be non zero is that c should be a subsequence of b so c should be an equally spaced subsequence of b right because c uh, has to be c has to contain all the elements which are common to both a and b so definitely c should be an equally spaced subsequence of b equally spaced is not important because c is an arithmetic progression so obviously it's going to be equally spaced but c should be a subsequence of b if that is not the case then we can blindly output zero as we have done in a few of the sample test cases as well so that is the first thing so can anybody here tell me how we can check this how we can check whether or not c is a subsequence of b because uh, the total number of elements here is 10 to the 9 so we can't do this naively right so any ideas how we can check this <coughs> no ideas okay so uh, the way we can check this is that we can simply check for the first element of c and the last element of c both of them should belong to b right so what we can do is we can check for two things we have to check for two things and if these two conditions are satisfied then we can definitely say that c is a subsequence of b first thing is that uh, c1 and so first element and last element of c should belong to b so uh, that is something that we can do very easily because the first element of c is given to us and the last element of c is equal to nothing but uh, the first element of c let's call it ac plus the number of elements in c let's call it nc minus 1 into let's call the common difference of d a uh, common difference of c is equals to dc this is equal to the last element of c right this is just a general arithmetic progression formula so the last element of c is going to be ac plus nc minus 1 into dc so we have the first element and we have the last element so we have to somehow check whether these two elements belong to b or not so how to do that so checking if uh, ac and lc belong to b so that is again very easy so we can check if ac belongs to b or not by doing something like this so if ac belongs to b it is going to be some its uh, position is going to be something right so let's say that the position of ac in b is x so what we'll get is we'll get something like this ab plus x minus 1 times uh, so, sorry hari um, yeah, yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt yeah yeah actually i lost you at uh, like why why this claim is true that c should be uh, a subsequence of b it's given that a and b so c should uh, be a superset of a intersection b no no no, no. What... c contains only elements which are common in both a and b 
yeah do you feel me oh, the only elements which are present in, in c should be the elements which are common in both a and b so there are Correct. elements which are in a and in not b so those elements are not present in c similarly there are elements which are present in b and not present in a and those elements are again not present in c so that is why c should be a subset of b instead of a superset right okay i see yeah so c should be a intersection b right okay so the way to check this is that ab plus x minus 1 into db should be equal to uh, ac right and uh, by doing this we can find the value of x so first of all ac minus ab so x is equals to 1 plus ac minus ab uh, divided by db so this value should be integral first of all and this value should lie so x should be integer and should lie in this range from 1 to nb right 1 to the number of terms in b obviously because if this is not the case then even though x is an integer it is not lying inside the apb right so we will find x we will check whether it is an integer or not if it is an integer then it should lie in this range from 1 to nb okay and we can write similar equations for lc also so we can replace this ac by lc we will find x again and we again have to check whether x lies in this range from 1 to nb or not if uh, if at all that is the case then we are sure that there will be at least one uh, at least one arithmetic progression for a and that arithmetic progression is just equal to c so we are sure that there exists at least one ap which can be a okay <laughs> but otherwise if uh, uh, sorry, x is not I, yeah yeah can you can you go a bit slow and uh, can you explain the last statement okay okay i did not get it so uh, your uh, this statement where that x should yeah. lie in the range from yeah, 1 yeah. to nb okay okay yeah okay so um, i hope this much is clear that ac plus nc minus 1 into dc should be equal to lc that is the last element so this is obviously clear and yeah. these two uh, this statement is also clear that ab plus x minus 1 into db should be equal to ac right where x is the position of ac in b okay this much is clear right yeah yeah okay yeah. so we can find out x and obviously x has to be integer so if x is not not an integer then obviously this element ac does not belong to the apb but if x is an integer then the position x is what <coughs> x is the position of the element ac in b and so this position has to lie somewhere in this range from 1 to the number of elements right it can't be negative it can't be greater than nb do you feel me do you uh, okay okay i got right? it got yeah. it yeah yeah correct so that is why x should lie in this range from 1 to nb uh this is a mistake which actually i made in my first submission i just checked that x should be less than equal to nb i did not uh, verify that x should be greater than or equal to 1 as well that is why i have an incorrect submission as well so basically we have to find this value of x for ac as well as for lc and we need to verify that uh, both these values should lie in the range from 1 to nb so this is the first condition the second condition is that uh, the common difference of b should be a factor of the common difference of c so what i'm trying to say here is that dc modulo db should be equal to 0 and the reason for that is obviously here we can see that <coughs> dc is equal to 3 times db so obviously dc has to be equals to some number x times db right so this is another necessary condition i hope this condition is clear and if these two conditions are satisfied then obviously all the elements which are in c are also in b right so is the second condition clear to everyone uh, sorry i didn't really understand this okay okay so as you can see here the value of dc is equals to 3 times the value of db right this is 1 times db this is 2 times db and this is 3 times db right okay yeah yes so uh, do you think it is possible if uh, dc is not equals to some number x times db it is do you think it is even possible that uh, this c is an arithmetic progression and is a subsequence of b no that shouldn't be the case yeah so that is why dc modulo db should be equal to 0 and these are the only two conditions which are required so now we have uh, verified whether or not the answer will exist whether or not the answer will be non zero if these two conditions are satisfied then there, the answer will be greater than 0 otherwise we can simply output that the answer is zero so i hope this much is clear now okay yes okay so now uh, let's try to find out what exactly is going to be the answer okay <laughs> so uh, now let's try to see so we have seen when, when the answer will be zero now let's see when the answer will be infinity
Okay. So let's say we fix a common difference for a. So let's say we fix the common difference. for a, which is equal to DA. Okay. So let's say this is the thing that we have, right? So how is the situation going to look like now? <coughs> Obviously a contains all these green elements because uh, these elements are common to both a and B. So obviously a is going to be containing all these elements. So let's take red color for a. <coughs> so now let's see what's going on here. So obviously a will contain all these elements, but there are these, uh, these two blue elements in between every two green elements. And obviously no such blue element should be a part of a. So that is one thing. A should contain all green elements. But no blue element. And that is because if a contains a blue element, then that particular element becomes common to both a and B and therefore should have been a part of C as well, but that is not the case. So obviously a should contain all these green elements, but a should not contain any of the red elements. Okay. <coughs> oh, okay. So also if DC modulo DB was equal to zero, obviously DC modulo DA should also be zero. DC modulo DA should also be equal to zero. And that means. So you can see that the uh, value of DC is only up till 10 to the nine. And that means if we are fixing the value of DA, we are basically iterating on the factors of DC. Okay. <coughs> so for, for a value uh, to be a candidate for being the common difference of our APA, it should be a factor of DC, but are all factors of DC, uh, actual candidates? Well, that is not the case. And let's see why all factors of DC are not possible candidates. And the reason for that is that. <coughs> There might be some factors of DC for which A will contain some blue elements. Okay. So A should but, not contain. Uh, yeah. But if it was a factor of DC, then it should have been green, right? Factor hmm. of DC should have been green. No, uh, the value of DA should be a factor of DC. I'm not talking about any elements of a, I'm just talking about the common difference of a that okay, should be, sorry, a, sorry. yeah. So, uh, there might be some factors <coughs> of DC for which a will contain some blue elements and we have to somehow find out which are these factors and eliminate them. Okay. So let's see how that is going to happen. So let's draw another drawing. So we have these two elements of C, these two green elements, one green element here and one green element here in between, there are some blue elements, which are a part of B. So let's say this is blue. So let's say there are four elements or let's say five elements here, right? So in between every two green elements, there are these five blue elements and, uh, this particular difference is equal to DB. So this is equal to DB. And this particular difference is equal to DC. Okay. And now let's, uh, let's write down the position of all the elements of a, obviously this element has to be in a, and this element can't be in a. So let's say we have here, 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 and here. Okay. So let's say we have something like this. Obviously this can't be the case. Let's just erase it. So we erase this one and we erase this one. Okay. Let me write it again. So, so let's say these are the positions of all the elements of A here. Then here, then here and then here. Okay. Yeah. So there are these uh, two elements in between, right? Okay. And this particular difference is equal to DA. Okay. Now we know that DA is a factor of DC and DB is a factor of DC. So obviously this position will be occupied by an element of a, by an element of B and thereby by an element of C as well. Okay. That is, that is cool, but we need to make sure that no position in between is occupied by a red element as well as a blue element. 
so what you want to say is that we draw lines of length db and da and we need to make sure that the first time the ends of these lines coincide it is at coordinate bc right they should uh, they should meet first time at bc because if they meet in between then we will have a situation of collision and that is something that we don't like <coughs> i hope i am making sense i am not making this too confusing for you guys i just need to make sure that the first time these two lines meet so i am drawing these lines right so the first time that these two lines meet at their ends it should happen at this particular position it should not happen in between okay <coughs> but where do these lines actually meet for the first time can anybody uh, tell me will that yeah. be gcd uh well not really it it will actually be the lcm of da and db right so let's say we have uh 2 and 3 so 2 and 3 meet at 6 right and 6 is their lcm similarly 4 and 3 meet at 12 and 12 is their lcm right so these two lines will meet at lcm of da and db so lcm of da and db should be equal to dc that is another condition that we have so we will look at all the factors of dc such that the we will look at all the factors da of dc such that the lcm of da and db is equals to dc if that is the case then that is a uh, that is a viable candidate for being a common difference of our apa okay i hope i am making sense is this clear yes, why yes. why da and db why the lcm of da and db should be equal to dc yes but the, yeah, then you said it will be a a candidate it won't always be considered yeah yeah it will be considered that is what i meant so we have almost completed the solution now let's just see how the solution ends and how to actually compute these values okay so we have made sure that uh, the elements which are green are common to both a and b and we have fixed the common difference of a now only two values are remaining which we have not fixed that is the first element of a and the number of terms of a and these two values are basically saying that we haven't fixed the first element and the last element of a because fixing the first and the last element basically means we are fixing the first element and the length so we need to find the number of possibilities for the first and the last element of a okay so let's see how we do that so the first thing is when will the answer be infinity well so if we can see here all these green elements are the are the common elements which are like which are common in both a and b so towards the right of this last element which will be the next common element it will obviously be this element just give me a moment yeah so it will be this element let's say there was one element here and sorry so let's say there was one element here and one element here so obviously if b was something like this then the next common element that we would have found would be this one right because we are leaving two elements but uh, these two elements are not really there in b it is going out of range right yeah 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 we are going out of range but i am just saying that if these two elements are there these three elements are here then this was the next common element and so this was the next candidate for being in c but we are going out of range and so uh, this element obviously will be a part of both a and b <coughs> but since we are going out of range nothing is stopping us from putting an end point to, so nothing is limiting us from putting an end point to a we can have as many elements as we want in a right we can increase the size of a as much as possible so is this making any sense in this particular case if these three elements are not here the answer is going to be infinity because there is no particular limit on the size of uh, the arithmetic progression a i can extend it to the right as much as i want there is no limitation so that is why the answer is going to be infinity in this case so let's formally write it down <coughs> so basically uh But yeah. I, I didn't get why it is in this case only. In every case, we will have a multiple. Which yeah. So let's see. Right? Let's see. Let's see in what cases the answer will exist. So the first thing is that if L C, which is the sorry L B, which is the last element of B plus D C, right? We can see that this element is equal to L B plus D C, right? We are increasing by D C. So if L B plus D C 
is greater than the last element of b with uh, the last element of uh, i'm sorry so uh, yeah yeah sorry sorry if lc plus dc sorry yeah so this is lc the last element of c and uh, yeah yeah this is lc and lc plus dc so if lc plus dc is exceeding the last element of b if this is the case then the answer is going to be infinity i think i made a mistake somewhere here yeah so this is this should be green right yeah this is equal to lc yeah and this is equal to lc plus dc so if lc plus dc is exceeding lb then the answer is going to be infinity and the same argument can be applied towards the left side also so what we can say is if either of them uh, uh have this condition then uh, we'll have an infinity yeah, yeah 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 so ac minus dc if this is less than the first term of b which is ab then again the answer is going to be infinity okay so these are two obvious cases when the answer is going to be infinity now let's see when the answer won't be infinity okay so let's try to draw some things so let's say these are our blue elements the main thing to note in this problem is that we are taking all the common elements of a and b in c we are not leaving any elements and that is why the answer is getting to be finite and let's say these are the elements of c okay so there are just three elements in c something like this okay uh, now <coughs> obviously these elements are present in a and some other elements let's say these are also elements which are present in a so let's look at this last element this last element obviously will be present in a because the difference between this element and this element is going to be da so this element will be present in a right but if this element will be present in a it becomes present in both a and b and so should should have been in c as well right so if the size of a is such that it is big enough to contain this last element then this last element should have been in c as well because it is a common element to both a and b but that is not the case so that means that we can't have this element as the part of a and we can add just one element here and these are the only two possibilities for the end point of a make sense a can either end here or it can end here but if yes. it ends here then uh, these this element becomes common to both a and b and therefore this element should have been in c but it is not in c so we have two choices here and similarly we will have two choices here towards the left so we will have one choice here and we will have one choice here and the next element will be here but this can't be a, a part of a because if this becomes a part of a then this element becomes common and it should have been in both a and b right so we have two choices here and we have two choices here <coughs> so so what what exactly is this two what is the analytical formula of this two well it is nothing but the number one? of uh well uh, not really b minus 1 of, of c right? no uh that is not true actually so it is nothing but dc over da this value 2 is nothing but dc over da because uh, this entire difference is dc so this entire difference is dc and this entire difference is da so in between there will be dc over da values right so let's say x is equals to dc over da so we have x choices in the left and x choices in the right for the ending and starting points so for the starting and ending points respectively okay so the total number of ways is nothing but x into x right x square yes so yes. we have x square ways so this basically completes the solution so the solution is iterate on all factors of dc let's say we are at a factor i 
so we just need to verify if lcm of i and db is equal to dc or not if that is the case then add x square to your answer and this is it this is the entire solution so are there any doubts this this is a one line solution to this problem we can have a look at the code as well so first we verify if uh, c is a subsequence of b or not so i am finding the value l and r which are the two positions of the first element and the last element and these two values should be in the range from 1 to nb if that is not the case then uh, i will simply output zero and then there are these two conditions that uh, lc plus dc should be greater than lb and ac minus dc should be less than ab if these two this is the infinity check right yeah 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 this is the infinity check so if these two any of these two conditions are true then the answer is going to be infinity as i have done here and if that is not the case then we just iterate on all the factors of dc we check if the lcm of da and db is equals to dc if that is the case <coughs> we calculate x is equals to dc by da and add x square to our answer and that is it we do it for all the factors of dc make sense does anybody have any doubts this is the entire solution if there are no doubts then we can uh, complete the session okay so since there are no doubts i think this is it if you guys want to ask anything you can ask otherwise uh, we can end the session uh, i have a question it's yeah. not relevant to any particular <laughs> so it's a generic question so okay so like, uh, can you give can you give me a moment if chinmay is here can you stop recording please